and thank all of you uh, for taking this time today out of your busy lives and schedules. We have so many leaders in this room and so many voices through each of you are being present and represented. So I want to just start by saying thank you to all of you for the work you do individually and collectively to be a voice for so many people and in that way you live the spirit and the intent of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Thank you all. Um, Elise Buick, thank you for United Way and all of the service that you do and for, for co-hosting this event for us today. Um, it really means a lot and, and to be here in this beautiful, wonderful place, the California African American Museum, thank you for all the leadership you give. You know, many of you may know the California African American um, Museum was uh, designed by two phenomenal California architects who were native Angelinos, who also happened to be African American, Jack Haywood and Vince Proby. And this museum was opened in, uh, in 1984 for the 1984 Olympics by then Mayor Tom Bradley. So we not only celebrate history and this moment in history, but we are actually literally seated in a very historical place. Um, so thank you all. So I, I fully appreciate that I would not be standing here this afternoon as your Attorney General were it not for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I would not be standing here today if it were not for its precursor from 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. I would not be standing here if there had not once been a California Attorney General who went on to become the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Earl Warren, who of course led the court in that unanimous ruling in Brown versus Board of Education, the precursor to the Civil Rights Act. And I wonder then, standing here, whether Earl Warren, when he authored that great decision, which led to such an incredible progeny, if he wondered or thought that in so doing, one day his successor, 60 years later, might be the first woman and the first African American and the first South Asian Attorney General of California. And so many of you probably know my personal background. I am one of two daughters of parents who met when they were graduate students at the University of California, Berkeley in the 1960s. My parents met while they were both actively involved in the civil rights movement. My sister Maya and I joke often that we grew up surrounded by a bunch of adults who spent full time marching and shouting about this thing called justice. And truly, among the many heroes of that great movement, that civil rights movement, there were the architects who were the lawyers, Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston, Constance Baker Motley, who understood the skill of this great profession of law and its ability then to translate the passion from the streets to the courtrooms of our country understood the power that we could have from a movement that was taking place on the ground to carry that through the courts of our land to make clear and true the promise that we articulated in 1776 that we are all and should be treated as equals. That was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And in that way, we know and you have heard from our incredible guests today, you honor us by being here. The Civil Rights Act is not only a moment in history that came about through incredible sacrifice, through the incredible leadership of so many people 
who lived in a way that was nothing short of courage, and many of whom died standing for the principle, and the principle that understands that this is about ensuring that all people will have dignity as well as equality. The Civil Rights Act then is, as we know, not only something that was signed on July 2nd, 1964, it is today still a living, breathing document. And it makes clear certain fundamental rights, certain fundamental truths. In particular, that there shall be equal access to all that allows us to live a life of dignity and productivity. There shall specifically be equal access to education. Equal access. <laughs> equal access to the workplace. Equal access to public accommodations. Equal access to the ballot box. It was an act that was compelled, if not propelled, by the action of incredible human beings. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Fannie Lou Hamer, James Meredith, Medgar Evers, James Cheney, Andrew Goldman, and Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, and so many other countless names who gave of their lives to ensure that we could stand here today in this celebration. And in fact, one of those names is one that, uh, that really is not often spoken. And it is the name of an individual, a man by the name of Claire Engel, who in 1963 was a United States Senator from Bakersfield, California. And in 1963, Senator Engel had suffered a brain trauma. He actually suffered a tumor, which rendered him paralyzed and unable to speak. But as the Civil Rights Act was making its way through Congress, he was determined to see it through. And at that time, as you can imagine, the votes looked tight. It was incredibly controversial and for that reason contentious. So Senator Claire Engel from Bakersfield, understanding that situation, demanded that he be taken to the chambers of the United States Senate by ambulance. He was then transported by a wheelchair into the chambers. When the vote was called, the speaker said, all those in favor, I opposed, nay. Senator Claire Engel on his wheelchair, unable to speak from Bakersfield, pointed to his eye. <laughs> So what he understood was there was an urgent need for change. And in that way that it is a living, breathing document, its urgency is no less present today than it was then. What they knew then, Engel and all those folks, was the urgency that was presented was pretty clear. They knew that in the Jim Crow South, as Billie Holiday sang, strange fruit hung from those trees. They knew that the laws supposedly creating separate but equal facilities created, in fact, second-class citizenship. They knew that whites only and colored signs designated for who could use a fountain, who could use a restroom, who could go to a theater or a courthouse or schools were inherently unjust. They knew that African Americans had to pay a poll tax or pass a literacy test in order to exercise their right to vote. They knew that there were four little girls in Birmingham who had been killed by a bomb in church. They understood the urgency of the matter. And while these images and memories evoke a thought about the Deep South, as has been said here today, let's not forget 
that California was a part of that history as well. Let's not forget that in our state's not so distant history, Chinese Californians were relegated to working in our mines, our railroads, our farms, and our laundries. Let's not forget they were subject to laws that were so discriminatory that they were forbidden from owning property. Let's not forget that Chinese Americans at that time, and for quite some time, had been denied a pathway to citizenship. In 1942, we know, and thank you, Karen Cormatsu, in 1942, in California, 110,000 Japanese Americans, Japanese Californians, farmers, children, teachers, veterans, were forced into internment camps. And interestingly enough, some 17,000 at that time were sent not far from here to the horse stables at the Santa Anita racetrack, about 20 miles from here. At the same time and in the same year that Seabiscuit, Seabiscuit had just run his last race. Let's remember, in the 1950s and before, California's farm workers, and Dolores Huerta sends her regard. She had to travel to Mexico today, otherwise she'd be here with us. California's farm workers, most of whom were immigrants, were denied collective bargaining rights and denied minimum wage. In fact, Dolores Huerta, at that time, left teaching to go and co-found the United Farm Workers with Cesar Chavez and said, I quit because I couldn't stand seeing kids come to class hungry and needing shoes. I thought I could do more by organizing farm workers than trying to teach their hungry children. And in the 1950s and 60s, African Americans in California, many of whom had come west after World War II, faced unemployment, substandard housing, and inadequate schools. Many white communities right here in Southern California fiercely resisted housing integration, often with threats of violence. African Americans in Los Angeles County at that time were unemployed at a rate two to three times that of whites, and two-thirds of the adults in African American and Latino communities were high school dropouts, and almost 14 percent had completed less than five years of school. We in California, too, share a dark history when it comes to many of these issues. But in spite of these moments in our history, California has also had great moments of progress. We have been, in many ways, at many points in history, a model for our country in promoting social justice and in the protection of fundamental rights. Let's look at our history in another way. On women's rights, in 1911, nine years before the passage of the 19th Amendment, California was one of the first states to grant women the right to vote. In 1969, four years before Roe v. Wade, the California Supreme Court protected a woman's right to choose. On equal access to education, in 1946, you have heard Sylvia Mendez's story. In 1946, eight years before Brown v. Board of Education, the Federal District Court in California said that the case of the families of those five little children would go up and it would be declared that separate was not equal, right here in California, on equal access to marriage. Here in Los Angeles, in 1948, 19 years before Loving v. Virginia, California's Supreme Court made us the first state to declare a state ban on interracial marriage unconstitutional after a Latina woman and an African American man were denied a marriage license under California law and on equal access to public accommodations. In 1959, five years before the Civil Rights Act, California passed the UNRWA Civil Rights Act, barring discrimination in public accommodations based on race, 
color, religion, ancestry, or national origin. So there is a lot to remember, some of which makes us ashamed, and some of which makes us very proud. And when we think about then where we are, I can't help but think of what Coretta Scott King said so well as a word of advice and as a word of encouragement. And she said, freedom is never really won. We earn it with each and every generation. And I think when she said that, she made a couple of points clear. One, it is the nature of this fight for civil rights that it must be fought and won with each generation. These gains will never be permanent by their very nature. And then two, for that reason, let us never allow ourselves in this great battle and fight for civil rights, let us never allow ourselves to become tired or overwhelmed. Let us never give up, but instead remain vigilant, understanding the very nature of it all. And so I say to us here this afternoon, we are that generation that is being called upon right now in that ongoing fight for the ideals of our country, in that ongoing responsibility to recognize this living, breathing document, the Civil Rights Act, we are the generation that has the duty and the responsibility to keep it real in terms of its meaning and its purpose. And so let's look at then where we are and what are our challenges. On education, in California public schools today, the average black and Latino student attends a school where 75% of his classmates are black and or Latina. In California today, in our public schools, the average black or Latino student attends a school where 70% of her classmates are economically disadvantaged. And race, sadly, seems to be a major factor in whether a child will even attend school every day. One California study found that Latino elementary school students are chronically absent at four and a half times the rate of white students. In another study, one out of four African-American kindergartners were chronically absent at a rate of nearly five times higher than that of white students. On criminal justice policy, Latinos in California are twice as likely as whites to become homicide victims, and homicide is the leading cause of death for African-American boys and young men aged 10 through 24. Let me say that again. The leading cause of death for African-American boys and men aged 10 through 24 is homicide. On access to economic opportunity, on average, white women make 78 cents on the dollar that white men make. African American women make 64 cents to that dollar, and Latinas make 53 cents by comparison. So while we have a lot to be proud of, there is work to be done. On marriage equality, while I am very proud to have presided over the historic marriage of Prop 8 plaintiffs, Kristen Perry and Sandra Steer, almost one year ago today. Nationally, more than half the states in the United States of America still deny same-sex couples the full dignity and equality that they deserve. And on immigration, Congress has failed to act repeatedly while every 78 seconds, a family is torn apart. By the way, as a result of that fact, you should know also that there's a study that was recently published 
that documents the fact that 44% of Latinos today are hesitant to report being a victim of crime for fear that police will question them about their or their family's immigration status. And just today, the United States Supreme Court in the Hobby Lobby case rendered a decision restricting a woman's access to quality and affordable and preventable reproductive health care, denying her the ability to make a choice about her own body and the health decisions that come along with that. We have a lot of work to do. And on all these decisions, I would suggest that we must ask, where are we being true to those fundamental principles that talk about fairness and justice and dignity and equality and opportunity? The Civil Rights Act is indeed a living, breathing document that makes clear there are certain fundamental rights. And California has a long history of fighting to protect those rights. So today, 50 years later, we stand here, all of us, united as we rededicate ourselves to making real its promise. And on education, let's talk about what that looks like. Let's recognize that right now, elementary school truancy is one of the biggest issues that we can actually solve when it comes to what is happening or not happening, in particular with poor children and children of color. Let's deal with the fact that when we talk about a child at the age of four who is on public assistance versus the child who enters school at age four in an, from an affluent family, do you know that the child who enters school from an affluent or educated family has heard 30 million more words than that child who is entering school on public assistance? Not 30 different, million different words. 30 million words has heard that much in terms of conversation. When we look at where we have to go today then, I would suggest that in California on this issue of education, we have to recommit ourselves as a community to taking a look at what is happening with our poor children and our children of color and understanding that there are significant differences in the way they are experiencing or not education. And it must be one of our greatest areas of focus, understanding that that was at the heart of all of the principles behind Brown versus Board of Education that led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 on criminal justice. Let's look at where we are in knowing, again, those statistics that speak to the disproportionate nature of who will become a victim of crime, as an example. Let's rededicate ourselves today with our law enforcement leaders. Charlie Beck, the great police chief of Los Angeles, is here. I've been so fortunate to partner with him in the work we are doing right here in Los Angeles. Folks, I was invited to the White House to talk about the work we're doing here. The work we're doing right here in Los Angeles, around Back on Track LA, focusing on a public-private partnership with our faith-based leaders, with our leaders in our educational systems, with our leaders in law enforcement and throughout the community, the Chamber of Commerce, all coming together around focusing on young, first-time, low-level offenders and bringing education and jobs to them so that we can shut that revolving door that invariably leads to a public safety issue for us all. And on economic opportunity, we must continue to do what we as a great state have been doing, and I give credit to Governor Jerry Brown. We have signed and passed legislation increasing our minimum wage. We must continue to support that kind of policy as a way to lift people up. And we must recognize also, on the issue of economic opportunity, one of those fundamental rights there is no question 
We all know, and it is true, when you lift up the status of women in that dynamic, you lift up whole communities. We've got to <laughs> narrow that wage gap. And on immigration, you know, it's, it's not a state issue, it's a federal issue. But the reality is, we've got to move this thing along. They need to pass comprehensive immigration reform at the federal level, and we've got to do everything as a state to make that happen. And in the interim, I am proud to share with you that last week I also issued a bulletin to all of law enforcement in the state of California to emphasize a very, very simple point. As the top cop of the biggest state in this country, it is clear to me on the law that local law enforcement should not be used as a tool of ICE and to patrol the streets as immigration enforcers. I want Charlie Beck to make those decisions, not them. In the spirit, and to make the decisions about what's best for public safety, in the spirit of Gonzalo Mendez, Fred Korematsu, Cesar Chavez, in the spirit of Ed Roybal, Tom Bradley, Betty Hill, we have a collective duty to them and to each other to take these most intractable issues on. And we also have a duty, I believe, to understand the tool that the Civil Rights Act is for us. And all that it promised and made clear in terms of everything that led to it and what it does for us more specifically. It was the result, the Civil Rights Act, of kneel-ins, of sit-ins, of boycotts, of voter registration drives, it is the product of activists and politicians and students and faith-based leaders and lawyers and farm workers and even a seamstress who just didn't want to give up her seat on that bus. It was made possible, and this I cannot stress enough, it was made possible, I believe, as it all worked and as it must work, only because as the bottom line, it created a coalition of people to support it, who understood there may seemingly be differences among us, but on these fundamental rights, there is no difference between us. And so those of, here, those of us here who work on education or immigration or women's rights or criminal justice reform or housing rights, we are all in this together. Those of us who are working on marriage equality, those of us who are focused on economic opportunity, we are all in this together. The way that Civil Rights Act of 1964 came about, because you know it didn't come easily, was folks walked out of rooms like this, seeing at each other as being not only equal as human beings, but equal in purpose and equal in dedication to fundamental rights. My charge to everyone today, as we leave this moment, this anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, rededicated more than ever before to the coalition that we know is a winning coalition, the coalition that we know we have to be committed to being a part of if we are going to see, as this generation of leaders, the kind of leadership we saw in the past. Going forward, we know we can do this. We know we can do this. There is more than binds us than keeps us apart. And so I say to everyone today, let us rededicate ourselves to the words and the principle and the spirit of that great civil rights movement, and let's walk out of here in collective purpose, marching on, leading on for equality, for dignity, and justice for all. Thank you.